Hi there. Just want to put this video out there as a bit of a carry on from a handover that we would do on site. So if we were doing a solar and battery storage install for you, typically the handover takes about half an hour. Uh, during that half an hour we're explaining how your system works, going through the apps, portals, any questions that you may have then we'll do our best to answer. However, we do realise that there's an awful lot of information that goes across within that half an hour. So I think this should be a good a good exercise because ultimately you guys have got the ability to pause it, rewind and go back to it. And obviously if there's any further questions on the back of this, please get in touch with us, that's not a problem. So I think the best place to start is always to understand the priority of where your power and energy goes. So if you are getting solar panels and a battery install, which nearly all of our installs are, the, the, they're always prioritised so the, the power that's generated from the roof gets used in your home first. So that's the first priority and any excess after that, and let's be honest there's going to be a lot of excess after that, will go into charging your battery and then pretty much after the battery is charged it goes back to grid. Now it's worth trying to get your head around that because I think it's the most simple concept that if you can get your head around you'll be able to maximise what you've got a whole lot better and then also if we throw in solar car charging into the mix you have to be mindful of those priorities because the solar car charging grabs onto that energy that's going back to grid so that, that pretty much covers your priority but for me, that's probably one of the most important things to try and remember. Power and energy. So I've talked about this in some of my previous videos. Again, it's a good exercise to know the difference. So power is what your solar panels will generate and energy is what you store. So let's just make the sums pretty easy. Let's say you had a 400 watt solar panel. And let's just say that panel, solar panel was generating peak power, which doesn't happen often, remember. So let's say you had 10 panels, then that's 400 watts times 10, that's you get 4 kilowatts. And let's say that was generating for a full hour, you've generated 4 kilowatt hours worth of energy. So that's the difference between power and energy. Taking solar out of the equation, if you had a 2 kilowatt heater running for two hours you've used four kilowatt hours worth of energy so that's the simple difference between power and energy so again it's a, it's a good one to get your head around so power is measured in kilowatts energy is measured in kilowatt hours so what have you got going on on your home and your roof so nearly always we're installing solar and battery and again nearly always it's through a hybrid inverter not always it might be a grid tied inverter with an AC coupled system but for the purposes of this video we'll probably concentrate on a hybrid inverter which is predominantly what most of our customers get so you're going to have solar panels on the roof so they'll most again most of them are attached to roof hooks the roof hooks go onto rafters rails panels we've actually got a really good video on youtube that will show you exactly what we do on the roof so panels go on the roof now usually it's two strings so that's just another term for two circuits so that's dc circuits so those circuits will run from the hybrid inverter all the way back to the, the same inverter so it's called a series circuit and there's two of those usually so let's just say you had 12 panels again normally it would be a six and six split but there's absolutely nothing that says it has to be a six and six split so though those will come back to isolators they're nearly always the black ones so again we go through this in the handover but we can see no real reason for you the customer to be messing about with the isolators whether they're the dcs or acs so those strings come back from the panels to the isolators and then they plug into the inverter so then let's take another example of the hybrid inverter it's going to have a battery so it's usually underneath or to the side of it it has to go pretty much close to it because the the lead from the inverter to the battery is only two meters long so again different systems have different setups but the batteries 
will usually have a, an isolator on the side of it or it will have a completely separate isolator. Again, I can think of no real reason that you would want to isolate that battery. Uh, if you're going on holiday, you need that battery on because you might as well run off the battery at night. I can see no, no reason for switching it off other than if you were doing some specific testing, but again, I can't think of many reasons for doing that. So the battery would then plug into the hybrid inverter. So then we need to talk about the AC supply. So nearly always we fit a four-way mini consumer unit. That's because it's essentially the easiest way to get around of quite a lot of potential problems with existing RCDs, um, all sorts of issues. So a little four-way consumer unit normally goes in, but not always. And then we run an AC supply. So that's usually a domestic cable from that consumer unit up to the inverter. So either side of that cable, so inverter side and the consumer unit side, will have an AC isolator. That is a, a means of emergency switching, but it's also a means of if, if there's an electrician working in and around your consumer unit area, they absolutely have to switch that off because he or she could get into a situation where he's working on one board but it's actually getting back fed via the other board. So that's why there's always going to be labels all over that area warning somebody that there's solar on the roof. So it's very important to, for them to remember that. And also those AC isolators are a form of emergency switching. Let's talk about your handover pack. So the handover pack will be done by Julia or Leslie in the office. That's certainly not my job. So they will basically get to work on that, I would say, a day or two after we are completed. And then they should, they're should pretty quick at turning that around. So I'm just going to read to you what, what comes out in your handover pack, because again, it's not really my job, it's not my expertise. So you're going to get an electrical certificate. So you'll have seen us messing about with testing kits, so that's us testing the AC sides. Crucially, we're also testing your panels, so we've done all your DC testing as well. So that will come out in a PV test report. You're going to get another copy of your schematic line diagram. You should have a line diagram at your inverter and down at your consumer unit. So another one of those will come out for your copy. Your design calculations, your MCS certificate, that's the important one. You're going to get your inverter slash battery manuals. So that will be manufacturer specific. You're going to get a little guidance on shading and maintenance and a little guidance on your start up and shut down procedure. So two things probably I would take from that is the important one is your MCS certificate because you're going to want to set up what's called a SEG payment. So that's Smart Export Guaranteed Payment with an exporter. Remember that does not have to be who you're importing electricity with. So for example, at home, we import with Octopus Energy and we export with So Energy. At the time, they were offering the, the best deal. That's why we went that way. So and Octopus, to be fair, are quite easy to deal with. Now, the one that, that's been giving us headaches all year is the DNO notification. So we will have got DNO notification acceptance essentially to install your kit. So whether that was via a G98, a G99 or a G99 Fast Track, we've already had that before we install, installed for you. Now, when we are doing your handover kit, we then have to tell them that it's finished. So it's essentially a bit like a sign off. And the problem is or was, they were sitting on that for weeks, sometimes months, and there was no notification coming back to us or to you guys, the customers, to let you or us know that it's actually been signed off. So the problems that we kept getting were customers were phoning us back and saying, look, I'm trying to sort out a, a SEG export here, but they're saying you've not signed it off. And we always had to say we have. It's because the DNO are sitting on it and they're not doing anything with it. So Julie tells me though that they are getting a whole lot better spin, so Scottish Power Energy Networks, who most of our installs are with, but not all of them, they seem to have now got a team involved to deal with this, so it is getting turned around a lot quicker. So they have to give you what's called an export empan. 
bit like your import M pan, but it's an export M pan number. So crucially, what you guys need for your SEG export is your MCS certificate and your export M pan number. So those are the, the two things you'll need for your SEG. You set up a SEG, it's, it's nothing to do with us. That's a contract between you and your exporter. Just touching on maintenance, it's a question we get asked quite a lot from customers. Is there any maintenance required? Basically no. So solar panels are self-cleaning, assuming they're on a pitch. Now, I have seen on one of our installs a little sort of green film of sort of algae coming onto the panels. It's quite rural and there's trees just at the back. There's obviously something coming off the trees. So I would advise that customer to get some sort of brush, a bit similar if you're washing your car, wash those. However, other than that, I've seen no green algae or anything like that on our panels. So I would say there's pretty much no maintenance. In terms of testing, you should really be getting your electrics tested every five years. Within that five year period, you would obviously want to test the AC side, but also possibly do a, a string test on your panels. However, if there was a an issue with your panels, you're probably going to know because you would realise from your generation, whether it's your app or the online portal, that there's an issue. So basically to answer that question, no, there's not really much maintenance required. Another good question, similar to maintenance, is insurance. We at home told our insurers that we put solar and battery in, it made no difference to the price. Uh, of our policy however it's probably worthwhile just mentioning to them just to keep you right but as far as i know there's no obligation that you have to tell them but again i'm not an insurance expert apps and portals so the app obviously everyone knows what an app is i would say try and get good at the app so the app for me is really good for day to day just checking in see what kind of generation we'll get crucially how much percentage is in the battery. A lot of real number people are into the portal and they're extracting all sorts of information because it, it basically data logs all the time and it stores it. So if your system has a portal, which is essentially the cloud-based version of the app, there's a whole lot more information to go in there. I would encourage customers to go in and play about with both. I don't really think you can break anything, so just go in, you know, get comfortable with the system. Ultimately, if you know how all the system works, you will get the most out of it. On the subject of getting the most out of your system, so again, this is almost like going back to the start, realising what kit you're, you're getting and where the prior priorities go, but you should also be mindful of its limitations. So uh, we need to start using some examples here. Let's say you had 10 400 watt panels on the roof. That would typically be into a 3.6 kilowatt inverter. So you have to be mindful that you're not really going to get more than 3.6 kilowatts out of your system. So there's no point running a 3 kilowatt dishwasher, wash machine and tumble dryer at the one time. It's just not going to happen. So you want to get into a, a situation where you load shift so if the sun's shining, you really should hammer it in my opinion, so make care while the sun shines. The smart thing to do would be have an appliance on one after the other. Now, I know that's not always possible, but if you can do that, you absolutely will um, get most out of your system. So going back to an example, if you had 3.6 kilowatts up for grabs and you're using a 3 kilowatt washing machine, and then you decided to put let's say a two kilowatt tumble dryer on, you've got a, an added up load of five kilowatts, your PV won't do that. So try, try to avoid that. And likewise, going back to the battery charge and discharge limitations, just like your solar, it will have a discharge limitation as well. So at night time, that might be 2.6, 3.6 kilowatts. It depends on what system you've got and, and essentially it's moving on all the time and these discharge rates are getting, charge and discharge rates are getting better. But you should always be mindful of these limitations. If you can get your head around that, again, you'll, you'll make the energy last longer and it will ultimately improve your payback period. 
these systems are called grid interactive. So what essentially that means is they're constantly going to be a little bit of energy going to and fro the grid. So what, what I mean by that is customers might say to us, they'll take a screenshot, how come there's the battery is not full yet, there's 40 watts going back to the grid? Because your system will have just took a snapshot at a certain point in time and there was 40 watts going back to the grid. But, you know, the next time it took that snapshot, it could be 30 watts coming back the way. So energy can't sit still, it's always going one way or the other. So the term for that is grid interactive. So please don't worry about that, it's, it's totally normal. Charging from the grid, or forced charging I like to call it. So essentially this is using some form of off-peak tariff to charge your battery. This is where these systems get really good and the payback comes down again. So not everyone has access to these tariffs, it's typically via an EV charging tariff now where they're trying to encourage you to charge your car during the off-peak times which helps the grid out but we can be charging these batteries on the same cheap energy. Crucially you can be running your tumble dryer, wash machine, lights, whatever else you may have on but the, the key is if you can get a hold of one of these tariffs, you absolutely want to be charging the battery. And again, especially in winter, in the middle of the summer, reality is you probably won't need to. Three months either side of the summer, you might decide to put 40% in, 50%, whatever it may be. You might be looking ahead to tomorrow's solar forecast to make an adjustment. So most of the installs we do, you can literally do that in, in a number of seconds just on the app. So again, if you've got any questions on charging from the grid, let us know. But you absolutely, if you can, want to get into one of those tariffs because you're going you're gonna to find it really helpful. Your battery and inverter will work together. So the best way to explain that is in a, in a good day where you're generating a lot, yes, you're charging the battery and then at night time you'd be running off the battery. But let's take a cloudy day where it's sunny and it's cloudy. So when the sun's shining, it'll be charging the battery. If the sun disappears, it'll be coming out the battery and going into the load in the home. Um, likewise, so on that same day where it's sunny and cloudy, so you might be generating 3.6 at one point so 3600 watts at one point and then you know 20 minutes later you might only be generating 500 watts so the 500 watts will go to home and or the battery and again if the load is needed in the home from the battery it will come from the battery so they're always working together to give you the power and energy when you need it i hope you found this useful to be honest, there's bound to be a few things I've missed even here because I've, I've not put an awful lot of preparation into this. I've been pretty much winging it. Um, but this is pretty much how a handover chat goes with, with our customers. And again, hopefully it was useful because you have the ability to pause, rewind and come back to us. But ultimately, with anything, pick the phone up, email us, whatever. Just ask us and we're, we're always here to, to help you out. So, hope it's been useful. And... Take care. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.